Today's episode is released one year after the U.S. Capitol riot. It examines the role of politics in the classroom and how good intentions can sometimes lead to disastrous ends. I'm Zach Rausch. Let's dive in. Faculty members need to really rethink what is the purpose of the university and think about how they want to talk about themselves as scholars and as teachers. Scholars identifying themselves as activists is more of a threat than actually being activists. Because when they identify themselves as activists, they're undermining not only their own credibility, but they're undermining the credibility of the entire university project. Our guests today are from Appalachian State University. Scott Welsh is Associate Professor of Communications, and Martha McCoy is Professor of Sociology. We'll hear their argument that the best way for professors to support democracy is to leave politics out of the classroom. Before our interview, here's Martha and Scott's blog, University Professors After the U.S. Capitol Riot, when becoming part of the solution is part of the problem. The narrator is Stina Nielsen. Soon after the January 6, 2021 U.S. Capitol riot, many higher ed professionals began asking, how we can proactively tie our work to political concerns, contribute to democracy, and help students create a more just and inclusive society. In light of the Capitol riot, we too reflected on the purpose of our work and higher education in general. Did we do, or not do, something to contribute to the current state of affairs? Some scholars will surely decide that they were not political enough in their courses or their scholarship. Indeed, as the old saying goes, if you are not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. For us, however, the Capitol riot underscores the need to recover the original meaning of academic freedom as a freedom from political pressure. We assert that academic work serves democracy only when it is shielded from the demands of those whose primary concern is victory in the day-to-day political and ideological contests that constitute democracy. The Capitol riot highlighted the necessity of a shared understanding and faith in the institutions that support our nation in order for our democracy to function. As many commentators have stated, the loss of faith in and credibility of the institutions supporting the nation, such as science, objective judicial decision-making, free and independent news media, and free and fair elections, spells the demise of trust in democracy itself. Increasingly, people do not trust that these institutions make fair, nonpartisan decisions. If people do not trust the media, for instance, then the media loses its ability to hold the powerful accountable. This crisis of trust in our institutions was evident when many citizens regarded the statements of a political party that appealed the presidential election results as equivalent to the statements of the judges who examined the evidence presented by the political group. The federal judicial system, not unlike the academy, is designed so that the decisions of judges are protected from the political concerns and temporary passions of the public. While the institution of higher education is attacked and defunded by a number of social forces, its credibility is no less crucial for democracy. Institutions of higher education work to promote rationality through systems of checks and balances that prioritize evidence and reason over will and power. Even amid errors in execution, peer review and faculty governance of the hiring, review, promotion, and discipline processes are intended to sideline irrationality, superstition, and political interference. In contrast, If higher education professionals see themselves as accountable to politics rather than to standards of truth and methodology, they will contribute to undermining society's trust in the independently produced results from inquiry that democratic institutions require. 
Scholars who characterize their own scholarship as in pursuit of their preferred ideological disposition, or for communities and causes with which they are politically aligned, variously described as scholar activism, making politics our job description, or bullying back, undermine the credibility of scholarship. Trying to be part of the solution is less and less distinguishable from the problem itself. If we want academic work and higher education to support our democracy and effectively contribute to freedom struggles in the long term, scholars will need to declare their professional allegiance not to political causes, but to the scholarly standards of truth and method in their discipline. As tempting as it may be to respond to the frightening insurrection of January 6th by banishing certain opinions or declaring allegiance with certain political movements, that would be succumbing to the tribalist temptations that undermine our search for truth. Upholding the principle of academic freedom upholds the purpose of the university as an institution that promotes rationality and whose credibility rests, like our judicial branch, on not being beholden to a political group or ideology. For just as the foundational ideal of the U.S. Constitution holds that citizens belong to one nation regardless of their ethnicity or religion, the foundational ideal of higher education in our country maintains that scholars pursue and teach truth, understood as results derived from the rigorous application of method, regardless of such identitarian or ideological categories. The rigorous application of method, of course, will sometimes lead to results that cast into doubt received wisdom and public opinion, leading to both partisan resistance as well as partisan uptake and the very choice of subject matter for scholarly inquiry, can have political consequences insofar as results from the application of method concerning previously settled truths often open up avenues of partisan appropriation that would have otherwise remained blocked. This does not change the fact, however, that the acts of inquiry and teaching are only political insofar as the rigorous application of method is always a threat to those who would attempt to insulate received wisdom and seemingly settled truths from further inquiry. In other words, academic work is political only in the most grand sense possible. It resists the colonization of the whole world by those who would make truth serve power. Instead, academic teaching and research rests explicitly on maintaining a space in which inquiry can proceed unmolested by partisans and activists who prefer some truths at the expense of others. Acknowledging that academic work is political in this grand sense does not, however, give license to faculty members to use their positions to push political agendas in their scholarship or in their classrooms. Rather, we must strive to protect the scholarly enterprise from the agendas of activists and partisans inside the academy, no less than those applying pressure from without. This is because scholarship is only of value if the results derived from the rigorous application of method are understood as protected from the desires and designs of activists and partisans. Without this kind of trust in the scholarly enterprise, its value to democracy is lost, and the academy becomes just another political lobbying organization indistinguishable from all the rest. The Capitol riot can be seen as a function, at least in part, of the increasing absence of public trust in institutions charged with distinguishing truth from error, journalistic, legal, and scholarly. The Capitol riot reminds us that the most important thing scholars can offer a democracy is credible knowledge claims. The only way to be credible and trustworthy is by doing our best to keep political pressures, whether from the right or the left, from being perceived as setting the agenda of our teaching and scholarship.
If scholars don't want to be censored whenever an activist, religious, or other group decides their findings are offensive, then we must use academic freedom as a shield, not as a sword. In other words, academic freedom protects scholars from those who want to impose a political agenda on their academic projects, but does not give scholars license to pursue a political agenda in their research or teaching. The great test of higher education today is our commitment to academic freedom and the concomitant commitment to discovery and truth. Academic freedom holds power and politics in restraint by the rigorous adherence to method and the requirements of our scholarly guild. We answer to that guild, and not to the government, college administrators, wealthy alumni donors, religious groups, corporations, or activists. In this way, scholars are expressly not of the people. Our findings are not by the people, and we work only indirectly for the people. This freedom from politics enables our scholarship and higher education as an institution to serve the public by offering research-based, non-ideological results from inquiry, upon which all parties, including those engaged in freedom struggles, can credibly draw. Dina Nielsen reading Martha McCoy's and Scott Welsh's blog, University Professors After the U.S. Capitol Riot, when becoming part of the solution is part of the problem. Now our interview. All right, Scott and Martha, thank you so much for coming on to Heterodox Out Loud. It's a real pleasure to have you both here. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, my pleasure. And the piece is so timely and so important But before we dive into the blog, can you both just tell me a little bit about your academic background and how you became interested in this kind of work and in Heterodox Academy? Well, I'm a sociologist, and for many years I directed a women's and gender studies program at two different universities. So both those fields are often seen as very political, either because of how scholars approach the work or because of how outsiders see and interpret the work that we do. So I've always thought of myself as a bit of a maverick and a heterodox thinker. And so for me, Heterodox Academy and its values of viewpoint diversity are incredibly important and near and dear to my heart. I'm a rhetorician um, by, by training. Um, my PhD was in rhetoric and public culture. I'm currently chair of the Department of Communication at Appalachian State University. My interests, you know, historically have been in how do political theorists think about what political speech should be or look like in democracy? And that begins to spill quite often into what should academics be doing in the context of democracy. There was a trend toward thinking about all scholarship as inherently political. And as I began to think through that, I began to have some real questions about whether that was a constructive way of thinking about what scholarship is. And I guess following the events of, you know, January 6th of last year, that question, you know, became even more salient again. Well, and Scott and I were already working on a much longer project on the history of this idea of scholar activism and and a, an engaged turn that universities seem to take. And so we've just been meeting and talking and about this and studying it for so long. And then when the Capitol riot happened, we saw all these scholars and organizations making pronouncements about the Capitol riot and how important it is for faculty members to, in their research and or in their teaching, be more political, be more committed to making the right political changes that our society seemed to need. And there's just more and more pressure on professors to pick a side in this politically polarized society. And it, I believe we really need to resist that temptation to pick a side because we'll lose credibility in the end if we do that. The fact that you both work in, like you said, in women's uh, women's studies and women's gender and sexuality that are as perceived as being some of the most political fields, why are you different than maybe other people in your field? In my case, When I was directing women's and gender studies some years ago, we, meaning many of us in programs around the country, 
were targeted by far-right organizations who demanded through Freedom of Information Act requests our budgets and our all kinds of documents and all our syllabi, and they tried to position us as having a left-wing political agenda that, you know, we were pushing for gay marriage rights or uh, lesbian adoption rights or abortion rights. And the only way I knew to defend what my program did was to talk about us as academics, which we were. And so well, our, our job isn't to represent any political activist organization. We're doing scholarship. I began to think about what I did in those terms because other people outside of academia were politicizing what we did. To what extent is this actually a problem in the academy of professors being very political versus how much is this uh, just a public perception problem? My view on that is that, and I've written a little bit about this previously as well in the Journal of Philosophy and Rhetoric, that a lot about what scholars do is just traditional scholarship and they identify it as activist or political just because they're studying things that are perhaps controversial and maybe the truths they're uncovering, you know, could be politically troubling to some, but that doesn't make it political. It just means they're doing scholarship. They're studying things, they're un uncovering truths, and those truths will perhaps be used by certain kinds of partisans and not others, but that doesn't make it partisan. It just means they're doing their jobs as scholars. So for me, one of the main issues is the identification of oneself as an activist is the problem um, because they're just doing scholarship and they're doing good scholarship and it may have political implications. And that's what academic freedom is designed to protect is doing scholarship that could have political implications. That's why we have academic freedom. That doesn't make one scholarship political. Um, it just makes it, it's relevant and we should want scholars doing relevant things. And so as you're both professors, do either of you ever bring your personal politics into the classroom? And what does that look like if you do? I have a sort of a snarky answer. Um, I've never taught a course on Scott Welsh's politics. Uh, that, that's, not on, that's not on the books anywhere. I am never the subject of a class, so therefore my political views aren't relevant. And I would say for me, it's I take great care, and I think professors should take great care, not to try to persuade their students to adopt a particular political point of view or take a set of political or activist actions out in the world. If students want to be activists. That's their free choice, of course, and, and they have free speech rights and everything else. But to me, especially in women's and gender studies, I mean, we're very sensitive to abuses of power. And, and I think that's a terrible abuse of power that I would have over students because I'm going to grade them. And so they don't want to cross me, I assume. So I wouldn't want them to feel they have to agree with my view. If we talk about the research on um, women who are mothers and also working in the paid labor force, I'm not trying to push an agenda that none of them should become barefoot and pregnant or none of them should be stay-at-home moms or none of them should be working moms. That, that's up to them. Our concern is the research on these topics and, and learning how to read the research and understand and describe data and conduct research and have a kind of critical thinking and information literacy and a set of skills that will hopefully continue to develop throughout your life. But what do you think about the role of student activism on campus? And is that a valuable part of the higher education experience? Well, a lot of my students are activists. They tell me about that. And uh, they have every right to say or do what, whatever they want to do. I don't think it's my job to steer them in a particular direction. I'm hoping that I'm giving them information literacy skills and communication skills and critical and creative thinking skills and so that they're better at doing whatever it is they are planning to do with their lives. You hear stories of professors giving extra credit to students for going and doing something, especially when it's a sort of campus issue. And again, I, I think that's an abuse of power. I think that it's completely understandable that students are going to be very engaged. And, and that's a good thing that they're engaged with issues and go and do internships and service learning projects and community service. There's all, all kinds of ways students are engaging in projects like that. And I think that's great. And I've even taught an entire course on feminist activism. And so many of those activist students took my class, but 
my job wasn't to present them with activist projects that they were supposed to engage in. We were studying the history of the struggle for women's rights, you know, since the 1800s in the United States. I'm not here to tell you what side to fight on. That's not my job to tell you about that. One of the lines in your blog that I I really, I, I just think it's such an excellent pithy statement. You say, scholars are expressly not of the people. Our findings are not by the people. And we work only indirectly for the people. What is the role and relationship from your perspective of professors to the general public? Ideally, we would want universities and scholars to be trustworthy, trustworthy sources of knowledge, information, results from study that, you know, politicians would feel they could use because they could trust it. I feel like the best scholar would be one that folks on the left and the right would be comfortable drawing from. That's why it's sort of horrifying when a political group or a wealthy donor try or you know a set of trustees or whoever it might be tries to block a professor from being hired or from getting tenure or to plant a professor or teacher at a university because they believe that that professor will push a particular political agenda the professors should be protected from those kinds of partisan influences. And that space of academic freedom is in faculty governance of the hiring process and the review process is to protect us from being beholden to uh, a religious group, a corporation, a government group, a wealthy donor, or an activist group. I would return to scholars identifying themselves as activists is more of a threat than actually being activist. Because when they identify themselves as activists, they're undermining not only their own credibility, but they're undermining the credibility of the entire university project. Yeah, it sounds like the role of the professors really is not a flashy job. It's like a very long, slow, patient process. And maybe people won't like that so much. (laughs) Well, and it can be frustrating because it is a a slow process. If you want to see immediate results or you have some big thing you want to push. You either need to do that in your own free time as an activist yourself or get into a different profession because, yeah, as a scholar, that's not really how it works. It's such a good point. And I I do think right now, as you said, we really are in a crisis of trust in more than just uh, our universities. And in the research that I've seen, there's a really low level of trust from the right right now in universities. Do you have any ideas of how do we restore and build back trust in our institutions? One idea for me is that faculty members need to really rethink what is the purpose of the university and think about how they want to talk about themselves as scholars and as teachers. What is the role of our research and our teaching? And be more clear about that. I think right now we've seen since the 1990s, people talking about themselves making activist changes. You hear faculty say, my activism is in the classroom. And again, they may not do actually anything very activist, but they say that to maybe to make themselves feel better. Or they talk about making, quote unquote, artful contaminations through their research. And I think those are things that inadvertently, however unintentionally, do undermine that public trust in higher ed. So I think that we really, as scholars, need to hold each other accountable to the original idea of academic freedom and the real purpose of the university. You know, parents are always going to be worried about what's happening to their children. Yes, they're they're 18, 19, but they're still their kids. And so that means we're in this very sensitive spot in a society and a culture where people project a lot of kind of control onto us because we're receiving their children at this really impressionable time. And so I think that we need to treat that really, really respectfully and recognizing that that could really be abused. And we should kind of try to feel that worry that parents might feel. The language of we're here to you know pursue truth um, and investigate reality um, and help students students learn to do that is one that both reflects what a university is, and I think it also has potential to sort of put some folks a bit more at ease. But when scholars identify themselves as activists, we're confirming the worst fears 
of other parts of society, parents. Well, in addition, there's other actors at the university, a growing number of middle managers and administrators who are not members of the faculty are increasingly seeing themselves as educators of some kind. And they've created a residential curriculum that they, quote unquote, teach in the dorms. And those are often explicitly infused with political activist goals. And Scott and I actually wrote a piece on that called The Shadow Curriculum of Student Affairs. And it didn't sit well with some people in student affairs, but it's it's the same issue is we have to be careful about inadvertently or positioning what we're doing, whether we're faculty members or staff members, as pushing a political agenda. We also need to hold our colleagues who are not faculty members accountable to this understanding of really an ideally uh, academic teaching and scholarship being based in expertise and not being really a political agenda underneath. If our listeners wanted to learn more about both of your work, where would you recommend sending them? I wrote a book about a decade ago called The Rhetorical Surface of Democracy. And I have a chapter in in that book that is also directly on this subject that addresses what is the role of scholars in, in democracy. Well, my two sole author books are Real Knockouts, The Physical Feminism of Women's Self-Defense, and The Caveman Mystique, Pop Darwinism, and the Debates Over Sex, Violence, and Science. And in both of those, I take a somewhat unexpected and bridge-building position within academic work on gender. So that might be a place to look at how I do my stuff. Is there anything that we didn't touch on, anything really crucial that you want to make sure that our listeners take away from your piece? One thing I might add is that for scholars who really want to see themselves as politically engaged, and that's really an important part of their identity, the university's role in society is deeply political in the sense that it is reserving a place for the investigation of reality, understanding the world around us that isn't reducible to the political needs of a moment. Democracy needs that. It needs that space. The achievement of having a place in society that is not reducible to the desires of a president or king or dictator is really an important achievement. And that itself is a really important political sort of principle to defend. Martha McCoy and Scott Welsh on Heterodox Out Loud. For more from Heterodox Academy on politics and higher education, go to heterodoxacademy.org slash political polarization. Subscribe and download Heterodox Out Loud wherever you listen to your podcasts. Davies Content produced this show, and a big thanks to Kara Boyer on our communications team. I'm Zach Rausch. Until next time.